Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya Rivero. The whistleblower complaint at the center of an impeachment inquiry against President Trump accuses the White House of participating in what some are calling a cover-up. A redacted version of the complaint was released today. We already knew that it accused the president of pressuring Ukraine to interfere in the 2020 presidential election. The incident in question occurred during a phone call in July. President Trump asked his Ukrainian counterpart to investigate former Vice President Joe Biden and his son Hunter. But it was also revealed in the complaint today that the White House may have attempted to hide that alleged misconduct by President Trump. The whistleblower says in the days following the president's conversation with Ukraine, quote, I learned from multiple U.S. officials that senior White House officials had intervened to lock down all records of the phone call, especially the official word-for-word -word transcript of the call that was produced, as is customary, by the White House Situation Room. The whistleblower says this was based on secondhand information from the recollection of several officials. The acting director of Thank national intelligence was grilled by lawmakers today about the person behind those allegations. Joseph McGuire appeared before the House Intelligence Committee. He called the case, quote, unprecedented. I am not familiar with any prior instances where a whistleblower complaint touched on such complicated and sensitive issues, including executive privilege. I believe that this matter is unprecedented. I think the whistleblower did the right thing. I think he followed the law every step of the way. Mr. Trump has denied any wrongdoing. He accused Democrats today of, quote, making up stories to get an edge in the 2020 election. What these guys are doing, Democrats are doing to this country, is a disgrace, and it shouldn't be allowed. There should be a way of stopping it, maybe legally through the courts, but they're going to tie up our country. For more on this, we have former CIA acting and deputy director Michael Morell. He's also a CBS News national security contributor. Michael, thank you so much for being with it's us. Great to be with you. So, based on this complaint, what do we know about this whistleblower? So I read the complaint, um, and I was struck by a couple things. Um, one is um, it's exceptionally well written. Um, it looks to me like an analyst wrote it, a well-trained analyst, um, in terms of the precision of language, in terms of the details, in terms of how it was formatted and structured. Short paragraphs, bullets, look to me exactly like an analyst. That's one thing. Two is. It was somewhat, looked to me like someone who was extensively involved in policy discussions about Ukraine. That doesn't happen with analysts who sit out in McLean, Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing that struck me was that it was someone who understands exactly what happens in the White House with regard to the summaries of presidential phone calls. Um, so my assessment when I look at all of that is that this was probably a CIA analyst who was on rotation to the National Security Council staff and was not in on the phone call, but when the folks came back from the phone call, this person heard all of this information and said, this doesn't sound very good to me. All right, now, how important, though, is it that this person's identity remain concealed? So I think, um, I, I, I fear for this person. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's gonna take too long before their identity comes out. Really? I would imagine. I would imagine the White House probably already has a pretty good understanding of who this might be. Um, only a handful of people come through the NSC staff like that. Um, so it's probably going to be pretty easy to figure it out. I'm, and, and I worry, I'm concerned about what will happen to that person um, when Don't, their name comes out publicly, right? Doesn't that person have legal protections, though? Um, from the government um, putting that information out, right? But. Um, I, I think it's going to leak. Um, I think it's a matter of time before reporters figure it out, and then that person's going to be attacked, right? right. And, and from every angle, they're going to try to undermine that person. Well, so I'm concerned about that. The president already, already attacked has, the whistleblower. Yes. Let's listen to what he said. Sure. The person that gave the whistleblower the information, because that's supposed to respond. You know what we used to do in the old days when we were smart, right? The spies and treason. We used to handle it a little differently than we do now. What is your reaction to that when, when you hear the president talking that way? So I don't use this word very often when I'm on the air, but I'm appalled. I mean, he's basically saying that this person should be killed. That's what he's saying. 
Um, and this person did exactly the right thing, right? This person saw something, heard something um, that they deemed to be um, the government acting inappropriately and used the exact channel that had been put in place to report government wrongdoing. Could have easily gone to the media, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and leaked it that way, but chose to do it the right way. So this is a person who has integrity, and this is a person who did this exactly the way you're supposed to do it, and this is the result you get. And yet the White House is saying that this information was secondhand, that the whistleblower did not listen in to this phone call, that most of the report is secondhand information. Is that significant to you? I think what's interesting is um, the complaint. When you read the complaint, it lays out essentially four, four concerns on the part of the whistleblower. The first is the phone call, right? The second is the cover-up of the phone call. The third is the follow-up. So the very next day, right, policy officials take action with the Ukrainians to make happen what the president has asked. And then the fourth is the, what happened prior to all this with the canceling of the assistance to the Ukrainian government, right? We know now with certainty that that first allegation on the part of the whistleblower is 100% right because we have the summary of the phone conversation. So even though they heard it secondhand, they nailed the first one. Um, and it sounds like there's enough sources here and there's enough details in the complaint to convince me that the other three are probably right as well. So what do you make of the whistleblower's allegation that this phone call was sort of covered up by the White House, that it was placed in a secret vault that is used for highly classified information? Do you believe that that is probably accurate? And if so, is that a normal way to handle the president's phone calls with foreign leaders? So when I read the summary of the phone call, I saw nothing in it that was classified. I saw nothing in it that was even close to classified. Um, and so there'd be no reason to put it into a classified system. In fact, there's a separate system where you put uh, presidential phone calls that are unclassified. And the whistleblower is claiming it wasn't put in that, it's actually taken out of that system and put into a top secret system that's used for covert action, right? Right. Um, for the purpose of covering it up. Now that's gonna have to be investigated, um, but since the whistleblower was right on the first account, I think the whistleblower has credibility on that that allegation as well, but it has to be investigated. Sure, we sure, don't know yet. Sure, of course. I, I do want to play what Joseph McGuire said today about his his justification for withholding the whistleblower's account. Let's listen. After reviewing the complaint and the Inspector General's transmittal letter, the Office of Legal Counsel determined that the complaint's allegations do not meet the statutory requirement, definition concern, legal uh, urgent concern, and found that I was not legally required to transmit the material to our oversight committee under the Whistleblower Protection Act. Office of Legal Counsel opinions are binding on all of us. In particular, the Office of Legal Counsel opinion states that the president is not a member of the intelligence community and the communication with the foreign leader involved no intelligence operation or activity aimed at collecting or analyzing foreign intelligence. While this OLC opinion did not require transmission of the complaint to the committees, it did leave me with the discretion to forward the complaint to the committee. However, given the executive privilege issues I discussed, neither the Inspector General nor I were able to share the details of the complaint at the time. Do you believe, do you agree with McGuire's reasoning there, and do you think he handled it correctly? This is a tough question. Mm -hmm. um, I know, I know Joe. Mm -hmm. um, he is a patriot. Um, he has done heroic things as a military officer. He has saved American lives with what he did as a military officer. He was put in an extremely difficult position here. Um, I think it was right for him to go to the Justice Department and say, what should I do? What are the legal issues here? I think that was the right thing to do. I quite frankly think that the Office of Legal Counsel probably made the right call that this was not, did not fall under the standards of the Whistleblower Act because the president does not work for the DNI and there were no in intelligence activities here. So you agree? But, okay. but, okay. but um, the Office of Legal Counsel 
told him that you don't have to send it. It didn't tell him you can't send it, right? So the question then becomes one of executive privilege, right? Executive privilege can only be claimed by the White House. Um, and it's unclear whether they did or not. And I think had I been put in Joe's place um, after the Office of Legal Counsel told me that I didn't have to send it, I would have gone to the White House and said, um, I still want to send it. This is significant enough for me to want to share this with Congress because at the end of the day, this is about national security. This is about election security. This is about um, an American conspiring with a foreign country to interfere in our democracy. This is a counterintelligence issue. So I'm going to share it and f have forced the White House to tell me not to. And then be prepared to resign if I have to. I think it's one of those moments. Amazing. We are at that moment. Michael Morrell, we thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise Welcome. with us. Thank you. Let's bring in our panel now. Weijia Zhang, Ed O'Keefe, Zeke Miller, and Jessica Levinson. Weijia is a CBS News White House correspondent. Ed is a CBS News political correspondent. Zeke is a CBSN political contributor and White House reporter for the Associated Press. And Jessica is a professor at Loyola Law School. Thank you to all of you for being with us. We do, I want to start with this new audio from the Los Angeles Times. I just listened to it with Michael Morell previously. We hear President Trump ask who gave the whistleblower this information because that is, quote, close to a spy. Can you put into context for us what is behind the president's comments here? Well, Tanya, we've seen before that this president really struggles to understand sometimes uh, the duties of, uh, you know, different branches of government and different agencies and what people are supposed to do when they see a potential problem, a potential abuse of power. Of course, in this case, he happens to be at the center of it. Um, and so in the past, we've seen that he seems to believe um, that these agencies, that these departments work for him. And if he is tangled up somehow with potential legal troubles uh, for whatever it is uh, on the table, then he believes that it is uh, amounts to treason, in this case, someone who is spying. And so that's why it's so troubling that, um, as Morrell just pointed out when he was talking to you, this person did exactly what he was supposed to do, exactly why there are checks and balances to to make sure that there is not an abuse of power uh, at the White House. And the president does not seem to understand that. Um, his defense is that he didn't do anything wrong, and that's why he is being so transparent. But obviously, if, as we have seen, it is not for him to interpret the call or right. the complaint. Um, but, you know, I think that is a great example of, of you know, something that we've seen in the past from the president. And as uh, his understanding of what people are supposed to do in their jobs. Right. And as Morell suggested there, the president's words about this whistleblower and whoever else he spoke to in the White House really puts uh, those people in perilous territory in lots of ways. Um, so, Ed, I want to ask you now, in today's testimony, McGuire called the whistleblower complaint, quote, totally unprecedented. What sorts of details did he provide to support that characterization? The whole document, uh, frankly, and, and there wasn't, frankly, too much conversation about what was actually in the document. There was more conversation today about, it seemed, about uh, why it was initially withheld and, and, and the thinking that went into that. And, and, and as you just discussed with Michael Morrell, the, the, the tortured thought process that he clearly went through uh, to reach this decision um, that ultimately got it to Congress, but perhaps didn't get it as quickly as lawmakers would have liked. But he was asked repeatedly, you know, about elements of this and, and kept saying that it was unprecedented and, and frankly kept saying it in some cases in response to questions from Republicans, which you could tell they weren't thrilled about. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, just the details in this about what exactly the president was doing uh, on that call, the events leading up to it, the questions about uh, the involvement of State Department officials, all of it clearly uh, w was considered alarming enough to him that he felt compelled to reach out to others and figure out what to do and ultimately get it into the hands of Congress. And Zeke, McGuire was also asked directly if the White House ordered him initially to withhold the complaint. Let's listen to that exchange. The White House did not, did not direct me to withhold the information. Neither did the Office of Legal Counsel. That uh, opinion has been unclassified and has been disseminated. The question came down to, 
urgent concern, which is a legal definition. It doesn't mean is it important, is it timely. Urgent concern met the certain criteria that we've discussed several times here. So it did not. And all that did, sir, was then just take away the seven days. So, Zeke, do we know then if McGuire ever spoke to the president directly about this? We don't. Uh, from his testimony, he played a little bit uh, coy on that one, in part because of his sensitive government position. As the acting director of national intelligence, he said repeatedly that his job is to consult and brief the president on sensitive intelligence matters, and his trust with the president would be violated if he were to comment publicly on that. At the same time, he didn't quite offer the—you uh, know, he, he didn't, you know, say if—he uh, wouldn't talk about any conversations if they did or did not exist. He sort of did imply, potentially, that there were conversations that did exist. Uh, that uh, that he that he didn't want to reveal because of executive privilege, uh, but that is uh, largely just parsing his words. That is not based uh, on any particular information here, uh, though it is you know judging by this president the way this president has carried out uh, discussing uh, discussing sensitive matters with aides in the past, investigations and the like. Uh, it is certainly plausible that President Trump would have asked his uh, McGuire for more information certainly over the last couple of weeks. And so, Jessica, what else then do we know about the allegations from the whistleblower that the White House, quote, locked down information about this call with Ukraine? I mean, that should be something that is fairly easy to prove or disprove through a certain amount of investigation. And how concerning is that allegation? I think that's actually one of the more concerning allegations, because it would show that there are people in the White House who have an awareness that what transpired in that phone conversation was problematic. It would show that there was a conscious awareness that they were trying to keep that conversation out of the public eye. And frankly, you know, if there's one thing that Americans can tolerate, it's a scandal. If there's one thing that history tells us Americans maybe can't tolerate, it's the cover-up of a scandal. Hmm. And so moving this information from the normal kind of bucket or computer system where it was typically held, and then trying to lock it down, move it into a code word protected separate bucket where you only have highly classified information, which we've just heard there was really nothing classified here. That looks like a classic cover-up. And I think that's what part of what just qualitatively changes what the discussion from yesterday to what we're talking about today. And so, Ed, I just want to ask you, this must be pretty easy to prove or disprove, though. I mean, there's got to be a record of who was in the room when it happened, right? And Congress just needs to subpoena those people and ask them directly if they were aware of the phone call being sent into a separate you know, sort of top secret vault. I mean, this should be pretty easy to figure out. Is that correct, Ed? No, nothing in this town is easy like that anymore, Tanya. You know that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, sure, they might come up with a list of people who were involved in this, but they will do their, uh, many of them will probably, uh, you know, try to delay and, and stall this investigation as much as possible, unless suddenly uh, the president says, go ahead and talk. Uh, because so far, at least, he's been remarkably transparent in releasing these documents as quickly as he has. Mm -hmm. So if that if that continues, uh, perhaps we can see resolution to this uh, faster. But you know, there are potentially, uh, you know, maybe just a handful, maybe dozens of people who, in one way or another, touched this situation or, or are aware of it, uh, and may have been involved in not only the phone call itself and setting it up, but the aftermath of it and whatever was being done to either put this somewhere where it wouldn't be found. Uh, or sort out the gravity of the situation. So, uh, you know, we don't yet quite know what specifically the Intelligence Committee will do next, who mm -hmm. they will want to talk to, how they will do it, whether they will subpoena all this or whether they can cut a deal quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't know also really to what extent the uh, other committees will continue with this and whether this falls under uh, the obstruction of justice investigation that's being handled by the Judiciary Committee or whether intelligence would continue doing it. These well, are the kinds of complicated these are conversations complicated. that they're going have to continue to yes, have and these are complicated the questions. And Jessica, I just want to go back to you for a second, since you are a lawyer. Legally, doesn't the committee now have more power now that formal, uh, you know, this is now a formal impeachment inquiry as opposed to simply an investigation as to what these committees were doing earlier? Isn't there more power behind the subpoenas now? Yes, I just talked about this with my students a, f a few hours ago, and they said, well, what's the difference? And I said, last week when I saw you, we were in an impeachment investigation. 
Today, we're in an impeachment inquiry. Legally speaking, what's the difference? And exactly, it's exactly what you said. There's this kind of supercharged subpoena power that shows up. And how so? Because we've seen with the investigations that one thing President Trump has said consistently to the congressional subpoenas is, you're on a witch hunt. What's your purpose? What's your legitimate purpose for asking me for this information? Now Congress can say, because we're in an impeachment inquiry, because mm -hmm. everyone understands this is part of our role in the separation of powers, this is our part of, part of our role as a check on executive power, that we have this investigative authority that's highest when there is an impeachment inquiry. Okay. And that's what our reason is. And so legally, the investigation is now on steroids. <laughs> yes, that's a so, great way of putting it. So, Ouija, McGuire was also asked about the role of the president's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, in all of this. Let's listen. What is your understanding right now of what Mr. Giuliani's role is? <laughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Congressman, <laughs> Congressman Quigley, I, I respectfully just refer to the White House uh, uh, to comment on the president's personal lawyer. Before this all happened, were you aware of his role or understanding what his role was, doing what you do? Uh, Congressman Quigley, my only knowledge of what uh, uh, Mr. Giuliani does, I, I have to be honest with you, I get from TV and from the news media, I am not aware of what he does, in fact, uh, for the president. So, Ita, how might the involvement of a private citizen complicate matters further for the White House? This is someone who has no governmental role and who, you know, detractors could point to easily and say, well, look, you're doing nothing but working for the president on a personal level because that's the only role that you hold, correct? Of course, and that's exactly why President Trump was asked this very question yesterday, and he punted on why Giuliani would be allowed to have anything to do with Ukraine investigating Joe Biden and his son. Um, and he said, you know, Rudy has every right to go there and investigate the origins of the Russia investigation. And uh, the president explained that that's uh, the only reason why his name came up to President Zelensky of Ukraine at all, because they are still trying to get to the bottom of what happened. And that is true. I mean, a part of that call summary uh, included uh, information about, you know, the president asking to investigate whether the email servers uh, that were hacked during the 2016 uh, presidential campaign ended up in Ukraine. Um, and, you know, that's seemingly what Mr. Trump is saying when he, he says that's why his personal attorney is involved. The problem is that doesn't match what Giuliani himself has indicated on cable news, taking a lot of ownership uh, for investigating Ukraine. In fact, uh, in an article that was just published, he said, it's impossible that the whistleblower will be considered a hero, and I won't be. That was in The Atlantic, mm -hmm. as him saying that as a quote. Um, and so he's really owning up to his role in this. And that is why sources here at the White House approach him with a collective eye roll. Just like, you know, why is Rudy Giuliani still out here uh, speaking on behalf of President Trump? Because every time he does it, it puts them in a more perilous situation. It puts the president in a position of having to explain Giuliani. And it, you know, opens the door for a lot of trouble that could easily uh, go away if Giuliani just stop talking. It is a questionable connection, no doubt. So, Zeke, I want, I want to ask you now, more than half of House Democrats are in favor of impeachment. There needs to be a majority of support to send the process to the Senate. Has the White House looked ahead to that possibility yet? And if so, how are they preparing? You know, the White House, you know, for the last year or so, has been uh, contemplating the prospect of impeachment, certainly once they lost the House in the midterm elections. They knew things had changed in Washington for the president. Uh, there were all those investigations. They weren't quite sure whether or not Democrats would actually go uh, go through with getting a formal impeachment inquiry. And it's still not clear just what the timetable is for when Democrats might actually bring some sort of vote to the floor, Articles of impeachment to the floor. But the the tactic that the White House has, t has sort of the approach the White House has taken to this from the very beginning has been almost uh, to 
goad uh, Democrats into going down this path because the president believes that it's going to be a political winner. Um, and, you know, when it comes to Rudy Giuliani's role or the pr public statements from the president or his campaign uh, over the last year and now going forward as we enter this hiding season, it's wor worth remembering that this is a political process. Impeachment is, you know, there, there are legal matters at stake. There are subpoena powers. There are, uh, uh, there, there are laws involved. There's an attempt to prove high crimes and misdemeanors. But ultimately, it's, it's, it's political. It's politicians who have to take votes either with their party or against the, uh, their, their party, uh, a president who is popular with about half the country and very unpopular with about the other half. Uh, it, it, all those sorts of things, um, you know, come to the factor as well as, you know, the 2020 uh, presidential election, which is very much underway right now. So all of that, the president is essentially trying to create a lot of noise between, right. uh, and he has been all the way through, and he will be going forward because that, you know, this is a political matter. He's trying to create the political noise to give himself political cover. Right. And of course, like you said, beyond all of this, it is still a political issue. So Weijia Jang, Ed O'Keefe, Zeke Miller, and Jeff Jessica Levinson, thanks to all of you for joining us.